Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series, remembering the legacy of the great Kansas City Hammett B3 organist, Everett Devan. He left us on July 3rd, 2021, after decades of being a skilled musician, mentor, and friend. During this collection of interviews, we try to pay homage to his life and preserve the voices of those that were moved by his existence. We hear from Kansas City Hammond B3 player Chris Hazelton, drummer Danny Rojas, singer Ebony Fondren, and guitarist Matt Hopper. We also hear from the great New York City drummer with deep Kansas City roots, Mr. Matt Kane. Enjoy this collective. This is Kansas City-based Hammond B3 organist Chris Hazelton. Essentially, my question which is kind of rolled up into a question and an addendum is this. How did this relationship happen between you two? And what has he done that's influenced you to this day that, that, that keeps you going as a musician and as a person? Well, I met Everett in 2004. Uh, I was a college student at KCK Community College and had played bass and piano previously. I was really into Modesky, Martin, Wood, and wasn't taking them too much seriously at the time. But I mentioned to my teacher at the college seminar that I was really into the sound of the organ. It was on Modesky, Martin, Wood recordings. And he said, well, if you like that organ sound, you need to go hear the, the Hammond legend that lives in Kansas City, Everett Devan. And so, you know, at his uh, request, uh, me and a couple of buddies snuck into Bobby's Hangout down on Broadway, all underage, a bunch of young suburban white kids uh, hanging out at an upscale black club. And uh, lo and behold, you know, the first night that I was there, and hearing and seeing the Hammond B3, and especially, you know, under his fingertips, uh, I was just floored, and my jaw was on the floor, and I had an epiphany that was like, oh my gosh, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. This instrument right here encapsulates all of the things that I want to do, to do with music. And so we snuck in a few more times, and I finally convinced Everett to let me take a lesson with him. He said, okay, come on, come on. And uh, that sparked a, a friendship and an apprenticeship and a mentorship that... Uh, Officially lasted a little over two years, uh, you know, taking lessons with him. But, you know, the, the mentorship and the apprenticeship really never ends in that kind of a relationship. I learned from him well beyond, you know, just the two years I took lessons with him. And he really taught me about not only being a musician, but how to find my own voice in music and how to be a band leader, how to be a professional performer. He always exemplified uh such a such a uh generous and kind of welcoming uh atmosphere on his bandstands he always had young cats playing in his band and he always welcomed a, a myriad of uh you know instrumentalists and vocalists to the stage to join him and uh you know he took it upon himself to really you know make the scene um you know he he organize benefits and things like that and, and uh any time that he was without a gig he'd be like, well, I guess it's time for me to go turn over some rocks and see what else I find. And uh, you know, there's a, an entire generation of musicians in Kansas City and beyond that are indebted to him and his generosity and his his wisdom and teaching and uh we you know, we're all better for it. That doesn't even say anything about what a monster player he was, truly a one of the greatest players to ever sit behind the Hammond B3, and certainly one of the heaviest groovers of all time. I mean, his, you can ask several people in Kansas City that uh, his bass playing was uh, better than pretty much all the bass players in town. And, uh, as uh, Todd Wilkinson uh, so eloquently put it, the guy can swing whole notes on a ballad. And uh, <laughs> there's no question. He was a special guy. This is Kansas City bass drummer Danny Rojas. So basically what I want to ask you is this. It's kind of a two-part question. Okay. First of all, what was the nature of your relationship? How did you meet? And what kind of lasting impact has Everett Devan had on you in your life and career? I think for me, the relationship that I had with him, I think it's kind of like what a lot of the younger players had with him. It's kind of 
kind of a jazz father, I like to call it. And um, he had expectations that he didn't really vocalize too much, but you could just hear it in his playing. When he would play something, you better know what to do with that. Now, if you didn't know what to do with that, there were ways that he would show you. Sometimes he would communicate that verbally, but other times he would do that musically. And if you didn't pick it up the first couple times, then he would he would find other ways to motivate you. Sometimes, you know, with the look that everybody talks about, he'll give you a look, and at that point you'll know Okay, I need to I need to pay attention. I need to make some mental notes as, as to what he wants, and um, that is what he he had. Those, those were the expectations that he had, and um, just musically, uh, I got a lot from him um, on how to be just ready, but to also not to. He always told me not to anticipate. Don't anticipate me. Don't trying to act like you know where I'm going to go musically because I don't always go there. So that was another thing he taught me was just to make sure I'm listening, I'm paying attention because things could change musically. And I think for me that wasn't just a music lesson, that was a lesson in life. I got a lot from him just just on that aspect of playing. This is Kansas City-based singer Ebony Fondren. So basically what I want to know is, talk to me a little bit about the relationship that you had with, with, uh, with Everett Devan and the lasting impact that he had on you as a musician and even as a person. Well, he basically was my starting point. When I first came to town, I wanted to be a jazz singer and I was told to go find him. So I did. And, uh, Went to his jam and went up to him, and I was like, I'm Ebony Fondren. I want to be a jazz singer. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit, and then he decided um, he would take me under his wing, uh, per se, and give me lessons, per se. I met with him, um, and that just began our journey. I went to his home for lessons, and... It was basically in how to perform as a jazz singer, like what to do. Like he didn't teach me how to sing. I knew how to sing, but he, he taught me how to be a musician on the bandstand with the band, you know, um, and not feel like it was a band and then it was me as the singer. And then he, and he taught me, Everett was just, he was a stickler. It, he was, you know, he was, he didn't work me until I knew at least 75 songs. Like, he you know, taught me how to, you know, respect myself as a musician and being on time and and dressing the part and, you know, working with musicians and listening and using my ears and communicating not verbally and non-verbally and as a vocalist, things that were very important that the band is going to be looking, you know, for, to you for and from you and expecting of you and, how to gain respect, you know, knowing those things as a vocalist, pulling out crazy songs and pushing me to off the ledge to scat because I was definitely afraid of it. <laughs> you know, just stuff like that on top of just mentorship, friendship. He was like my jazz papa. You know, my parents didn't live here for a while. And, you know, so my music family became my family. Um, until, you know, my parents moved here in 2009, but I was, for eight of those years, I was, I was, you know, on my own as far as, you know, figuring my way out, out of college and adulthood, and Everett was a major part of that. The last thing effect is just, I have certain expectations on the bandstand. My ears are very sensitive to rhythm and timing and groove, and I, you know, I, if I feel like when people aren't in the pocket, I, I literally tell them to get on it like Everett used to do. And it's a certain groove, a certain feel that you learn when you go to the Everett Devan University that you just can't you learn anywhere else. And Chris and Matt, Danny, you know, Rojas, Chris Hazelton, Matt Carrillo, 
Lisa Henry, anybody who's worked with them, but, you know, the students that were in my group, you know, we all, it's, it's the same, you'll hear the same thing. It's just a certain unwritten pocket, an unwritten time, timing and, and feel that you just you can't explain. You either get it or you don't. And your ear gets trained to just that, you're, it's like an inner metronome that you just you just know that groove always lies, you know. And I think that's why I still play with Matt and Danny and Chris to this day because they get it, you know what I mean. I don't have to, we don't have to talk about feel. We don't have to talk about how we want to play this song or that song, you know. If it's, you know, especially if it's something that we all did with Everett. He was funny and he was gruff. And he was, but but the sweetest man. And we were his kids. You know, he didn't have any. And we called him Papa, Daddy, Jazz Daddy, Jazz Papa, Papa Everett, you know, because he just had that, you know, that aura about him where he just collected us, <laughs> you know, and, and carried us and work, gave us work and took chances on on a lot of, you know, where, you know, other folks wouldn't in it, and he got joy in it. You could tell just by the way he would, you know, just sit there and smile with his little head wiggle and, you know, and give us all nicknames, and it was just, yeah, he was great. This is Kansas City bass guitarist Matt Hopper. Uh, let me just ask straight up, first of all, thanks for getting back with me, and obviously it was a pretty big event for Kansas City and the jazz community specifically to hear that Everett passed for as long as he was wielding his influence on the on the bandstand. And I want to know from you, I know that you've had history with him. Talk to me a little bit about your history with him and the influence, the impact that he's left on you. Um, when I first started out with him, I was uh, pretty green and he was first took me in under his wings to, to, you know, mentor me as a live performer and as a jazz musician. He would have me play, uh, we would get to play with many vocalists, so we would play a lot of songs, a lot of standards in a lot of different keys. We didn't have iRealBook phones with transposition keys. We didn't read anything. So on his bandstand, you would have to, if you didn't know the song, which happened to me quite a bit, he would allow me to use my ears and figure out harmony uh, where the changes go, how to solo over it, things like that, that usually you would, you know, sometimes uh, people won't hire you back if you're not ready. He would continually hire me and allow me to grow on his bandstand because he knew I, I had that enthusiasm and I loved the music uh, more than anything. And uh, just having that right there was was a huge a huge deal. And then not only that, but also the business then, how to deal with business, how to dress, how to tie a tie. No doubt, he taught me how to tie a, a double Windsor, just stuff like that. I mean, he was he was quite a big deal for me um, to get me to the point where I am now. This is Hannibal, Missouri-born, New York-based drummer Matt Cain with deep Kansas City roots. Basically, this is what I'm looking for. It's a two-part question. First, of, first of all, I want to ask you this: How did you meet him? What was kind of the nature of your relationship? A and B. What has been the lasting impact that Everett has had on you as a musician? Mm. I'll start with how I came to know Everett Devan. I moved to Kansas City from Hannibal, Missouri in uh, 1989, and the first band I played with was Lori Tucker's band. She talked about Everett a lot, and I started to feel like I knew this guy before I even knew this guy. Just, I heard his name a lot, and I was too young to go into clubs and check him out, so I just, I just heard about him, and he was already a local legend at that point. So I heard a lot about Everett from Lori Tucker, and then... Everett had a jam session. It may, might not have even been a jam session. And to be honest, I can't even remember the name of the place. But he had a thing going, and he had Don Glaza on drums. He had Bill Caldwell on tenor saxophone. And I think he had Danny Embry on guitar. And um, I went in. I sat in. In those days, I was maybe 22. I was not even close to being ready to play with him. You know, my concept was not even was non-existent as far as how the organ worked or how to play with an organ player or even just 
playing with people at that point. I was just really wild. And I, I just remember uh, I sat in and, and you know, a lot of times people would say, oh, hey, you sound good, you know. Man, he didn't say a word. And he had kind of a stern demeanor. Uh, I just kind of like, you know, tiptoed out and figured, well, one of these days, maybe I'll, I'll be ready. So that was, that was my first kind of experience with Everett. And then I moved away to New York and, you know, did 10 years in New York and then moved out to Jersey. And in New Jersey, the organ is, that's the cornerstone out here in Jersey. For all the jam sessions, it was organ. You know, Larry Young is from Newark, you know. There's a big tradition of organ players out here. I started to play with a bunch of organ players, people like Kyle Kohler and Pat Bianchi and Jared Gold and all these phenomenal heavyweight organ players out here. And then somewhere like maybe 2015, I, I made a return trip to Kansas City. A tenor saxophone player named Steve Lambert invited me to come play with him in Everett. And I was like, oh, man, here we go. Awesome. And I was just so stoked. And we played a full night at the Green Lady. And I'll never forget this, man. I mean, just after the first four bars, I was like, oh, wow, this is the real thing. Like the guys in, that I played with in Jersey were great and, and all that. But like, this just was a different feel, man. This was like, wow, like you just laid back in this big, comfortable couch. And, but yet with all the energy and drive, you know, it was like relaxed, but energetic at the same time. My concept had definitely grown by this point, And I just really tried my best to just play with Everett. And after the first tune, I'll never forget this. He said, he said, uh, now I like that. And I just, man, I just, I just, it made my heart just warm up and I felt great. I felt welcomed. I felt validated. And, and, you know, the whole night we just, we just made great music all night long. And it was just one of the most treasured experiences of my whole career. I was just so, I just, I appreciated him finally. Like when I was young, I kind of, I had no clue, you know, but I, I came back as a grown man and I was like, oh man. And we played one more gig. Um, a couple of years later, I came back and I hooked up a gig with Everett and uh, Danny Embry. And, you know, Danny's a, a master. To play with him and Everett together was like almost like a dream combination, you know. Um, once again, we had a great night and Everett was, if I remember right, he had to sub out the second night because he wasn't feeling well. And he was, I think, going through um, dialysis. He couldn't make the second night. But the first night, I mean, you wouldn't know the man wasn't feeling well. I mean, it was swinging. And he was just like the wise Buddha behind the, the B3. There was a presence there. And there was a deep authenticity. So those, those were kind of how I got to know him. Uh, it just meant a lot to me to to have been able to play with him after I got older and got some experience and I just appreciated him a million times more. I just felt like after I came away from that experience, I was like, you know, that is Kansas city right there. That is Kansas city. Like he was the embodiment like Aladdin was. When you think about those people, Milt Abel, Tommy Ruskin, those like cornerstones of the scene, you know, Russ Long, but people like that, you know, Everett was, one of them. He was like the, 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 the Mount Rushmore of the, the Kansas City spirit, I think. But I mean, the real proof is you could see how the youngsters responded to him over the years. Like he kind of had almost like this following, you know, people, young guys like Steve Lambert and the young cats appreciated him. And that was, that was awesome to see, to see him have that appreciation. So that, that was kind of my experience. You know, I just, uh, I got to play with him like two times and they were both profound. And you, when you came away from those gigs, you felt like you made some music that was, that was listenable. You know, you weren't up there, you know, jousting with somebody, you know, there was all this humility wrapped up in experience and this forward motion that playing with him had. I, I just think I consider myself super lucky to have, had that experience, you know, and Kansas City is lucky to have had a man like this around for 50, 60 years that he was on the scene playing. Uh, you know, Chris, Chris Hazleton is a great player, and that's, that's how it gets passed along. There's nothing cooler to see than to see the young dudes give it up 
to somebody, especially somebody like Everett. He wasn't a pyrotechnician in a way. Um, man, I mean, dude, his, his, it was all swinging, all of it. The the right hand, the 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 base, the base lines, the comping, the, the solo lines, like it. it it wasn't like a bunch of notes coming at you. It was the notes were embracing you. And that's a huge difference, you know, especially out here on the East Coast. A lot of times you, you sometimes get the feeling like cats are playing at you. As I get older, I, I, I have less and less patience for that. And, um, for you know, when I went back to Kansas City to visit over the past several years and I would hear somebody like Everett or somebody like Bob Bowman or Danny Embry or like the Masters, like you get you get this sense that like their their notes are coming from a different place, but especially Everett, you know, like like his playing embraced you. It, it didn't shout at you, you know. It didn't have uh, strict corners on it. It was round. It, he was a humble dude, man. But also, I think that, that one of the other senses I got about Everett was that, yeah, he was he was humble, but he knew how it should be. Period. You know, there were definitely stories of, of cats that he would give him the look if, if the, if the feel wasn't right. I think Don Glaza, Don Glaza was with him for a long time. Don Glaza was a really sweet dude. I met Don Glaza when I was really young in Kansas City. I was like 19. And he, and they had a steady gig somewhere for years. Like Don was his drummer. And they played together for years. I think it was Don Glaza that, let me sit in with Everett. And that was the first time I got a chance to play with him. You know, man, he was one of those dudes that like, you know, uh, very dignified, humble at the same time. I think that's, that gives the music its pliability, yet its strength. What can you say, man? I mean, the older I get, the more I pre I really appreciate these people. And a lot of times the experience that we have with them, it might not hit us or make sense to us until we're that age, you know, the, the way we look at the young cats now. When we were young cats, we might not have had quite the appreciation. That's why it was cool to see, that, you know, the young cats would, you know, really appreciate it ever. And, man, I mean, I know that Steve Lambert played tons of gigs with Everett, and that's just not something you get at any university. They ain't got that at the new school or the Manhattan School of Music or, you know, any of that. It ain't on YouTube. That's the significance and the weight uh, of that just you know this is a time for for us to kind of think back on that and and appreciate that and it gives us more appreciation for the the musicians that are that are still here doing it and man and it's a gift jazz is a a, a special very special kind of experience we're extremely lucky especially as music becomes more computerized we're extremely lucky that we have an appreciation for that. Uh, the more time goes by, the more I think back like, man, thank God I chose jazz and I'm not playing some music that's quantized on a computer grid. You know, you think about Kansas City, you think about Everett Devan, you think about Swing. It's, a, it's beyond special. It's like in its own category, you know, and for all those people that want to kind of make sideways jokes about jazz and this, that, and the other, Look no further than somebody like Everett Devan to just define what this is about. The universal element of it, you know, where like I think Everett was one of those dudes, like Aladdin was. It was like if if you can play and you're down for the cause and and you honor the swing and all that stuff, well then you can get on the bandstand and I respect you for that. Everett was like Aladdin that like you know he treated other musicians like grown ups. Right. Like you didn't get on. He wasn't going to he wasn't going to like treat you like a child. <laughs> you know, if you were going to step on the bandstand, then honor this. And that was another thing about Everett um, that I remember. He was quiet on the bandstand. He didn't talk a lot. He didn't get on the mic and say, you know, and put on a comedy routine in between songs. My experience with Aladdin with with Everett is that the bandstand was sacred. You know, and it should be that way because then the music is is gonna is gonna be sacred. That those are the things that come to mind. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and voices in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to all of these unique musicians and their voices that were moved by Everett. 
If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. <laughs> Neon Jazz.